So my name is Raylene Deck, and I'm currently a design lead at Bungie. I've been a designer for over 10 years with my start in the industry at Bioware, where I worked primarily as a level designer on Mass Effect 2 and 3, and then later on Dragon Age Inquisition. And, oh, thanks, thanks, guy, thanks, or lady, hi there. <laughs> so in, in 2015, I joined a new, newly formed team at Bungie, where I helped shape what would be the open world destinations in Destiny 2, focusing mostly on PvE, multiplayer design. So today, I'm gonna to talk about how to design for different types of people. And my examples come from my personal experience working at both Bioware and Bungie, and these companies focus on large games with big teams, right? So solving for different player types involves many disciplines, but this talk is only gonna focus on world design. But world design can mean something different to all of us. Right? I tried and I couldn't find a formal definition, but my designer ego loved this one. Right? So very few careers offer people the opportunity to become a god, yeah, it's awesome. But a career as a world designer might be as close as it gets. So in my world, our godly duties include things like level design, activity, quest, mission, world systems design, and good world designers are skilled in all these fields so that they can take a holistic approach when building experiences. So let's start by looking at why designing worlds for different player types is important. So as game designers, we build systems and mechanics in our games that tar target specific audiences, for example, party chat for social players, or leaderboards for competitive players, but do we really do the same when we think about world design? And if we know our audience, we can build worlds that are engaging for these players, and because we're human, what we value often changes over time. So for example, a new parent may only play shorter games because they have less free time, or maybe for someone like me, I now value multiplayer games over traditional single player campaigns because I use, a, I use games as a way to reconnect with my friends in my home country. So if we can understand what players value about our worlds, we can react and do less of one thing and more of another. And the point is to find our blind spots as designers. So it's tempting to want to put something for everyone in your game, right? So you can have an amazing story for immersion driven players and tons of collectibles for achiever players and PvP for competitive players. So you could do that, right? Some, some teams do, but the ones that try often fail. And that's because it's really hard to have something for every type of person in your game where everyone will be equally satisfied. So focusing on what the player values will help you ship because it'll narrow down that possibility set of what should be in your game. And this isn't easy to do, right? Like as game designers, we're not mind readers and a good portion of our time is spent iterating on features based on player feedback. But building the wrong set of features for your audience leads to feature creep, overscoping, and crunch, and crunching on something that players don't truly value is extra frustrating. So, before I go into examples, so this is the best player categorization I found. Um, some of you are probably familiar with this. It's like called the Gamer Motivation Model by the company Quantic Foundry. And I won't go into detail how this chart was derived. It's beyond the scope of this talk, but if you haven't already, I really encourage you to check out Quantic Foundry's work on their website, and they also have a talk on the GDC Vault. So you also don't have to read all this now. Right? I'm gonna be reference it, referencing this image throughout the talk. So at a very high level, Quantic Foundry found that each of the columns are highly correlated, and they call these clusters. So I'm gonna be organizing this talk around that idea. So first we'll look at world design for the immersion creativity cluster, and then the action social cluster, and then finally the mastery achievement cluster. So we're gonna explore three central ideas, and each of these ideas are catered towards different player types. The first is about techniques that make your world feel bigger than it is and that's center, centered around players who play for immersion and creativity. And the second idea is about techniques that make shared worlds feel friendly for social and action players. And the last one is about techniques that give players agency in the world catered towards mastery and achievement. So what does it mean to make small worlds that feel big? Right, so these traits, fantasy, story, design, discovery, they're typically found in role-playing games. And 
A common problem that happens in RPGs is that certain player motivations become at odds with each other. So there are players who want to immerse themselves in deep, rich stories, and then there are players who want to spend hours exploring and experimenting in the world. And on top of that, many RPG play players value achievement, striving for completion and power. So let's look at an example. So after shipping Dragon Age Inquisition, we heard feedback from players that they were feeling overwhelmed with the amount of content in the game. There were many objects to collect, puzzles to solve, and there was over 200 side quests. And the most memorable, memorable example of this is an area called the Hinterlands. And so this, this was the first open world zone to unlock in the game, and one of the biggest in physical size and had the most side quests. Players would spend up to 20 hours here in order to finish all the quests before moving on. And so spending so much time early on in the game in one open world zone was, when there's nine more to explore, was not the design team intention. Right, so we tried to get people to leave, right, like on Twitter, right, but it was too late, it's too late. Even this guy, this guy, this player knows their player type, they're completionists in them, they wouldn't, wouldn't let them leave, they just wouldn't do it, right, so. Um, many of the other zones that we had in Dragon Age had the same problems as the Hinterlands, right, so quests and activities didn't feel meaningful, and players expressed that large chunks of the open world game felt like busy work, and that players couldn't understand which quests were worth doing. So some of the open world design conflicted with what most players play Dragon Age 4, which is the rich story and characters. And so I believe that you don't need hundreds of hours of gameplay to satisfy players who enjoy story and exploration by designing small worlds that feel big. So let's look at some examples. One of the open world zones that players said that they enjoyed more than others was Crestwood, specifically the Stills Wa Still Waters quest line. So I'm gonna step through this quest as best I can, and then we're gonna analyze it. All right, so during the main campaign, the player is told to go to a stormy zone called Crestwood. Once there, they find undead attacking the nearby village. In the village, the player can talk to the mayor to ask why the undead are attacking. And the mayor says they are coming from old Crestwood that's been flooded years ago. In order to solve the undead problem, the player will have to drain the lake by releasing the dam to access old Crestwood that is currently underwater. After getting access to the dam controls, the player drains the lake and heads into old Crestwood. They then head deep into a cave and kill a boss that's summoning the undead. And so coming out of the caves with Crestwood no longer cursed, the world, is no long, the world is not dark and stormy, but sunny and peaceful. Uh, the player then heads back to the village to inform the mayor that Crestwood is safe, but the mayor is no longer there. He left a note on his desk explaining that he was the one who flooded Old Crestwood in the first place. Years ago, the villagers became very ill, and to stop the disease from spreading, the mayor flooded the village and killed them all. That was his solution. So, the player is then given a follow-up quest to go find the mayor. So I believe there are a few key points that highlight why this zone was memorable. The side quest narrative is easy to follow. So it's important to keep story concepts simple because people can only actively process a handful of items in their short-term memory. And in open world games, there are many quest activities active at once, and the player can complete them in any order. And so if the player has too many options, or if the story is too complicated, they lose interest. Secondly, the side quest narrative encompasses the whole zone of Crestwood. So there is one central problem for the zone. And for Crestwood, it's uncovering the mystery of the past to help save the village. After doing this, the player feels like they have completed the zone, given a sense of closure. If there are too many quests in the zone, or if each of each of them have different themes or narratives, it's hard to answer the question, what did I solve? So people want to see how their effort matters. After killing the boss in the cave and heading back to go find the mayor, the environment changed from stormy to sunny. In addition, new quests became available, so your work was recognized. And lastly, the side quest narrative ties back to the main game. So after finding the mayor, the player can use a global game mechanic that we have in Dragon Age called Judgment to decide the mayor's fate. And so this side quest creates a small connection back to the central part of a 
part of the game, and suddenly it feels worth doing. So let's talk about level design. So as I said, we built a lot of content in the open world maps, right? but during internal play tests, we got some surprising feedback. Players said that they were bored and they couldn't find much to do. But looking at that image, it's hard to know where to find the fun. Right? There's no meaningful choice to be made about which way to go when all the hills look similar. To the player, the open world areas kind of felt like this, right? like a flat, boring field. So we made some level design changes. We use a natural world to create landmarks using both lighting and shapes. So close to the player, they can see that there is probably something in that house. And then further away, they have a longer term goal of reaching that monument with the flag in the distance. There's a lot of talks though about the importance of landmarks, so I'm not gonna get into that here. But what is interesting is that during the next play test, the feedback was, wow, there's so much more stuff to do here. But actually, we didn't add any new activities. So sometimes adding more content isn't the right answer, but it's how you're presenting that content to the player. So the big takeaways here are to focus on building content that be can be integrated into the world and presented into ways that feels meaningful. So you'll have to decide what is most important when designing your worlds, right? So for RPGs like Dragon Age, it tends to index on these player types, right? Especially story driven. And sometimes that means less content for other types of players. For example, for completionless, completionists, there could be less quests, or for explorers, maybe less things to find. But that's okay, right? So I, I believe it's a better choice to build fewer quests at, high, at higher value than, losing, than risk losing engagement from your core audience. All right, so let's now take a look at action and social-oriented type players and ways to build worlds that feel friendly. And multiplayer world design right, is often a more complicated set of problems than single player. And this is because for better or for worse, one player can influence another player's experience. So when playing games, you want to be the hero, right? But in multiplayer worlds, there are tens, hundreds, or even millions of other players that want to be the hero too. And you want to spend time with other people but you also want to feel important. So as designers, our, multi our multiplayer worlds need to still feel personal, but personal has, doesn't have to just mean one person. It can mean you and your group of friends are feeling like they're accomplishing goals together. So many of the techniques that create small worlds that feel big can also apply to multiplayer games, but we need to shift our thinking a bit when we bring in multiplayer storytelling because in a multiplayer environment, storytelling should never negatively impact gameplay, right? So we need to make the world and the experiences in it to be multiplayer friendly. So now look at some techniques from Destiny 2. So on Destiny 2, right, so my team wanted to improve the social aspects of the quest system that was in Destiny 1. So in Destiny 1, after completing the main campaign, players could engage in quests and quests were long multi-step multi side activities that could take days or sometimes weeks to complete. Although quests were great at providing long-term goals, they were not so great for multiplayer because if I wanted to play some quest with my friend, there was a high chance that, that my next objective would be totally different than my friend's because we'd be on different steps of the quest. So it was hard to keep players together working, working on the same goal. If we decided if one of our goals was to improve social, that our activities needed to be shorter, or we had about 10 minutes in length, we felt that if these activities weren't very long, players would be able to join a friend who is halfway through that activity and not feel like they've missed a large story arc. So we call these activities adventures. And you can think of adventures as a shorter, kind of less expensive campaign mission. So during play tests, we had groups of players play adventures together. And many players would give feedback that they didn't understand what they were doing and why they were doing it. Each adventure has a short narrative that tells stories about the world, but players weren't really understanding that story context. So when playing together in a group, it's easy to get distracted away from the narrative because social interaction takes priority. 
right? So players are talking to each other, they're like running off ahead of each other, and they're just focusing on something else entirely. So our solution was to shorten and simplify our narratives. Adventures would start with a short call to action, a statement about what you'll be doing and why it's important. The player only really needs to pay attention at the start of the adventure, and if they miss a, some dialogue later on, it wasn't critical because at least we know that they should have a general sense of what they're doing. And on the level design side, we would place the adventure start location in quiet areas in the open world map where combat is less likely to happen. And so this gives the player a time to listen to the dialogue without getting distracted. So to keep action oriented and social players engaged, it's important that it's easy and fast to play together and the narratives are short and concise. And for these players, the designer's story right, is not as important as theirs. And crafted narrative, one-off experiences, they often take a back seat because your story feels personal to you and your group of friends. And yeah, mistakes were made, yeah. So, I mean, adventures were not perfect for our Destiny's audience. Um, I don't think they were uh, super fun as we wanted them to be to, re to repeat. And we found that players still value those long quest lines and we ended up bringing those back in a slightly different form. Destiny's player base also highly values pursuit. Right? And I think that we could do something when it comes to adventures in the future. Um, so let's look at another multiplayer activity in Destiny, public events. And public events are different than adventures because their goal is to bring strangers together. Right? Each public event is a short, less than five minute combat experience that spawns in and out of multiplayer zones that we internally at Bungie call public bubbles. And if a player is in a public bubble, they will be automatically match made with random players until that player chooses to leave that bubble. And when designing content for public bubbles, one of the most important goals is to make players happy to see each other. Right? And at a minimum, we want players to not be afraid of another human being. Yeah. And so the idea here is to build an environment where a stranger cannot negatively impact another player's experiences. So it should feel like the people around you are there to help you and you're there to help them. Let's look at some examples. All right, so a good way to get help is to show intention. And public events are advertised on the world map before they start for a few reasons. And it gives players the ability to plan their time and it gives a focal point for strangers to come together. And in the world, the public event location is like a physical flag marker and players can interact with that marker to get a bonus and a timer on their HUD to show when the public event will start. And the idea here is that a player wants that bonus so they click on the flag which lets other players in the area know that that player is planning on participating in the public event, so it's a good idea to stick around if you want help. But for showing intention to work, so people, players, they need to, to stop and smell the roses, right? So this is the importance of downtime. And to bring strangers together, they need to see each other. Right, so you need to find places to build in intentional downtime where the regular gameplay distractions are minimized. And so e emotes are a great example, like here. One of my design mentors at Bungie, Bungie, she would always say, if you don't build downtime in your game, know that players will seek downtime outside of it. So public events, they're difficult to do by yourself, right? but they're not impossible. You can technically solo one, but it'll be pretty difficult. And in order to encourage players to play together, we kind of ride that line on difficulty. If a new event starts up that's really difficult and a player sees nobody else nearby, they probably won't engage with it. And if the event is too easy, players, they don't need each other. So you need to do some hard thinking about how difficult your multiplayer activity is versus how much trust your players have with each other. So, and as like I was saying before, in Destiny public bubbles, it's a low trust zone. And so players are randomly matched together for a short duration. So it's not enough time to build relationships with other people. And so if difficult encounters are done poorly in an environment like this, and players fail your encounter, they're not gonna blame themselves, and they're gonna blame all the other players. 
So in, Destin, in Destiny raids, raids are a high trust activity. And so they require high coordination, skill, and communication. Players, they self-organize into groups, and they have, need to speak to each other in order to overcome puzzles and encounters with only hints from the raid designers. In public bubbles, though, players don't have that same type of connections with each other. And because of this, we try to match the mechanics to the amount of trust required. So for example, one example how this could go wrong, maybe from the Blade of Crota event in Destiny 1. And so here, one person needs to go and grab that sword and use it to kill a boss. But you can't guarantee that that one person won't just grab the sword and run away with it or just stand there and be a jerk. Right? So in public bubbles, there's little to no social consequences to griefing. And most people, they aren't jerks. But in a large population, you need to account for them, as well as for people who just generally don't understand the mechanic or they're new players. I've found that when designing shared worlds for action and social players, like immersion is a common confli conflicting motivation. So for example, the public event flag is kind of gamey, right? It doesn't, really, it doesn't really fit in the world. Um, I think that there's a sliding scale when it comes to immersion and multiplayer games. On one extreme end, like you don't want to just remove it because then the magic of the world is gone. And on the other side, you can't have it being too overwhelming where it negatively impacts gameplay. So, and I think that's the most important key. And you could make an argument that that flag should be like a different asset, right? That ties better into the destiny narrative. It's true, right? But I think you should pick your battles. Um, like how important is it to justify spending those resources? How much can you spend? And incorporating the story and immersion in multiplayer games kind of like halfway is sometimes worse than not doing it at all. So you have to be intentional. All right. So let's look at my last topic. So worlds that give agency for players who value mastery and achievement. So typically, people, we don't get excited when we're being told what to do. Right? So humans. We thrive when giving challenges, and it's fun to learn and try new things. In games, when being told to go here and now go kill exactly five enemies, now stand and click here and stand right over there, like it gets turns boring. And I think this is true for all players, but especially players who play for challenge or strategy. So they want to do things like get all the achievements or take on the toughest challenges. So what should we think about when building worlds for them? One way to create challenge is to place high difficult encounters in the world, right? So the above image is a dragon encounter from surprisingly Dragon Age. We got a lot of positive feedback when playing, when, from players who chose to fight dragons. And besides the great work from the gameplay team, I think they were popular for a few other reasons. Players were never forced to fight a dragon. They chose to go gear up and go dragon hunting on their own. And on the level design team, we would provide some guidance to show that there is a dragon in the area, for example, by having it fly by, land, roar, like, and fly by in the distance. And I think this gave uh, the player agency to make a decision on when and where they want to engage in a dragon fight without hitting them over the head with it. Which brings me to opt-in challenge. So thinking about challenge when, working on, when I was working on Mass Effect was interesting because the majority of players would play for like, the story and the characters. But there was a good chunk of players that enjoyed third-person shooter combat. Outside of world design, the systems team solved this by building different gameplay modes. Right? So you could play in full action mode, where conversations are auto-chosen for you. Or you could go full story mode where combat is easier, but the player could um, choose to focus on what Shepard says or does. Right? So when thinking about world design, we need to be careful about large difficulty spikes, because even if you can technically lower the difficulty, it doesn't, like mid-game, it doesn't feel that great, especially for many of our players' motivations revolved about around playing through the fights to get to the next story beat. And so, one of the missions I worked on 
it's called, what's called, uh, Grissom Academy. And it was a total cakewalk. It was super easy. <laughs> yeah. So the, like, this mission opened up fairly early in the campaign. So players had a limited set of abilities and weapons, but I think it's only saving grace was that the mission was optional. Right? So if you're dead set on shipping your Magnus Opus combat encounter in a game that isn't entirely focused on tough encounters, think about like when it should be available and who you're targeting. So a common way of thinking about creating mastery and achievement is through repetition. So in order to get good at something, you practice it over and over again. So for our purposes, here's a super oversimplified diagram. You complete a challenge in the world, you get better at it through practice, and perhaps becoming statistically stronger by earning loot. And then when you take on that challenge again, you're better at it, and then you're closer to mastery. Right? So, but a word of caution. Right? So if your game is about pursuit, and the easiest, which often translates to the fastest way of gaining rewards, is by doing something that is repetitive or boring, players will do it. Right? They'll do that thing for hours and ignore all the other fun activities that you built that also give rewards, but your activity takes too long, it requires more effort than, for example, standing in front of this cave for hours, like in Destiny 1. <laughs> yeah. But and to be fair, like the famous loot cave, was a bug in an extreme, extreme case, but the important point is that when designing for repetition, the world and systems design need to complement each other. And so when I, when I found when designing for repetition, like action is a common conflicting motivation. So if you don't account for a repetition in your activity from the beginning, it only takes one or two replays to quickly lose excitement. So I'm sure you've played a mission where a narrative twist or a surprising cutscene happened, and repeating that mission again just doesn't pack that same punch. So in these situations, I think your one-off expensive explosions and cinematics, they take a backseat. So instead, spend your action and excitement, excitement bucks on things like variability. Right, so where, where can you add surprises that changes the experiences with a, in not very expensive ways? varying degrees of success. So how can that player get better at your activity the next time they play it? And it's also important to think about what you don't need. Right? For example, is it fun to hear that same dialogue lines over and over again? No, probably not. So to design for agency with repetition, you gotta think systemically and globally. All right, we did it. So we looked at three different concepts to build worlds for different player types. And so before I wrap up, I want to leave you with some final thoughts. So the player categories, their guidelines. Each player is different and will not fit nicely into each category like we want them to. And most of us have player motivations that fall into multiple categories. So you can go find out what player type you are on Quantic Foundry's, web Quantic Foundry's website. It's pretty cool. And your job, my job, is to use these examples as starting points. Right? So they shouldn't be thought as complete solutions, and it's the principles that are behind them that are important. And think about who your target audience is and what is most important for your game. And don't forget to extrapolate beyond yourself. Right? So justify your design decisions by thinking about which humans they're for and avoid using justification like, this is cool, so we should do it, and that's the only reason why. Yeah. So, and lastly, world design is still in its infancy, just like games. Right? I'm excited to see where it'll go next as it changes all the time. And I think this is especially true for as the generation who grew up with games get older, like me. And I think we'll see new genres and world design techniques because players' motivations will change over time. And I believe that it'll be those designers who see this and design for what people value most that will see success. Thank you.